My name is Arai. I'm a co-founder of Nine Elements and CEO of Imagely. Uh, and my role at the moment is more like being a product manager, product owner. What I'm talking today about is three topics actually. First of all, how we failed our way to a successful product. I think you hear that a lot, but now you hear it from me. Um, then the next thing, how we evolved to a platform of creative tools, what it means, I will tell you later. And then next is I need some buzzwords. So how AI changed how we work together. So all the buzzwords, I forgot like the blockchain thing. Maybe I can just, you know, build it in my talk. So <clears throat> how we felt our way to a successful product. Um, maybe as a background, I'm co-founder of Nine Elements, which is something like an agency. I hate that word agency because agency could be everything. We're more like a software design team building products and services for customers. And one of the myths is that as such an agency, you're, you're never going to be able to actually launch a product. So we hear that a lot. We've been through a lot of talks with VCs, etc., and they're always like, oh, agency, no, 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 no. You cannot focus. So we actually built a couple of products and we were very not successful with it. Um, but it was not probably because we, there was not the focus, but because, mm, you know, just to blame someone else, we were betting on platforms and APIs that were closed. And then we had some troubles with other companies. We worked like we had like client for SoundCloud. We had a client for Twitter. It, we had a lot of users. We learned that a lot of users and a lot of traffic doesn't necessarily mean to make a lot of money. So that was the uh, hard lesson that we learned. And in the end, what we did, and that was kind of, I think for, for us, the, uh, the spark that we um, decided to build something that is more in our nature. So it's not something that is a consumer product, but something that we need as developers and sometimes as designers, which is a photo editor, because we had customers with the rise of the visual web, Instagram, Facebook, yabba dabba. So you had like a lot of images, then you have smartphones and suddenly everyone needs like photo editing capabilities. It's something very natural and every user needs it in every context, like CMS, like in a cloud storage, etc. So we had some clients approaching us and then we decided, okay, we build it in a way that others can use it and we built an SDK off of it, but it was very primitive. So it was very basic and it was more like a test balloon. We build it in a way that we can reuse it and we put it on GitHub and we just you know, thought, let's see what happens. And in the end, in, in the beginning, nothing really happened. We had a couple of you know, requests and then we had the first couple of clients that licensed our SDK. And then came a very, very, very big tech giant and asked us to, to license the SDK, which in turn, and when that kind of happened, we realized, all right, this kind of is a business because if you're able to you know, work with these big com companies, then you can actually work with anyone. So two years later, um, our product has quite evolved. We have added more platforms to it. And most importantly, we've grown as a team and we spun out a team from then elements, which is now called Imagely. And all we do is build tools for like creative tools and editing tools and, and also tools for computer vision. So next topic, how we evolve from photo editor to platform of creative tools. So, what I mean with that is once you start growing um, in terms of the number of customers, in terms of the overall volume, in terms of the platforms that you have, and most importantly, in terms of the business segments that use your, your photo editor, um, you start realizing it's not kind of a photo editor that you build, but it's probably more a platform of different tools like text, like image manipulation, like cropping, like adjustments, because some customers just need one of these tools, some need like a bunch of the others, but most probably they don't, don't need every tool. Like the use case is always different. And that's kind of a tough thing for us, like from a product perspective to find a good way to, to build and evolve your product in a way that you don't defocus, but also that you can really adapt to every use case that is using your editor in some ways. So in order to progress on this, we decided to sort of build a vision and something that we could all grasp on and, and say, okay, that's, that's what we do. And that's kind of a good guideline for us when we build our tools, when we build every little detail within the tools. First of all, kind of clear thing is, it's really important for us that we add business value to every app and service that is using our SDK. So we address product managers, we address 
uh, more or less the people that the, the developers who are actually integrating our SDK. So their user experience is super important to us. If it takes too much time for them to get through our SDK and, and, and integrate it, well, then we fail. We fail in the beginning and then we don't even have a business. But the second thing is even more important in the end to the product because what we want to achieve is that people that use our editor, so the customers of our customer, um, that they create beautiful designs instantly. So let me be more, let me just go a little bit more in detail so that you understand what actually this means. Um, as a designer, when we built, when we, when we have this task to create a tool which allows me to design something, I think in that. I think in Sketch, I think in Photoshop, I think in lots of possibilities and I think like I want everything. I want to be able to change everything, I want to do everything and I don't want, I just want 100% freedom. Problem is, this is not necessarily something that works with the user, rather than that we like to guide them through a process and not every user knows design, so rather than having this freedom we try to constrain in a beautiful way though. A um, very obvious example could be something like cropping. In this case, sometimes like having an aspect ratio is not something that is always clear. So here's a nifty detail uh, where we shift from just aspect ratios to use cases. So everyone who wants to like crop their photo to a Facebook profile isn't lost in, oh, is it two to one or is it three to one? But rather than that, they just see, okay, it's, it's profile, go for it. This one is good. So, next thing is what happens, and this is something, a use case that happens a lot with a photo editor or a creative editor or whatever you do with a photo when you put text on it, it's pretty clear most images are pretty noisy. So, you cannot read the text so well. A designer would say, all right, let's blur the picture and then it's readable. Or they would say, let's just darken it a little bit and then the text is readable again. So if you're not a designer, you would probably just, you know, find the most dramatic color you can find, put it on the image or on your text, and then probably change your text to Comic Sans Serif, and then you're happy, but it doesn't look good. So the way we try to, to handle this is that we bake something inside the text tool because basically every editor provides the possibilities to, to do this, or that, but the problem is the users don't know that. They don't know that they have to like put in a blur or an overlay. So what we do is we put these functions right where they belong into the text tool. It's a small detail, but it helps the user to do something kind of beautiful and not to diverge into using Comic Sans Serif or some strange colors. That's why we actually, we even try to avoid color palettes. We have that as an option because some users, some of our customers need that, but if it's just something for, let's say, the average user, we always recommend don't have a color picker because people will pick red and they will always pick red no matter what you know, image you have. And another use case for us was typography in general. So when you build typography as a designer, you have a couple of different ideas and a couple of different you have a lot of experience to do different things. Uh, and we actually came up with the idea that we try to optimize this a little bit at least so that people can build or create beautiful typography instantly without actually having any design expertise. Um, there is always this friction between a designer and non-designer. A designer would say, nah, it's not really cool, you know, I, I would do it much better. But actually for a non-designer, this is something they would really appreciate to be able to build something that looks kind of professional without being a professional. So, last topic. How AI changed the way we work. So it, it's not that there was an AI that changed the way we work or a Terminator that came and said, you know, you have to work harder or something like that. But actually, the, the whole story here begins with, um, with three dudes having an idea. So we have like three persons in our team, one, me is included in this case, that are a lot, that, that had a lot of discussions about the whole deep learning topic a year ago already. And we decided to invest considerable time in it. You saw that we're a team of 
20 people and having two or three people working on this means like it's a considerable invest. Something where we don't know what's, what, what, what is the outcome of this. So the first idea was that we wanted to use AI, machine learning, um, to, to get rid of like tedious tasks like, like for example clipping. When you do create a mask, it's always like work that nobody wants to do. And we thought, what is if we can do this like instant again? You know, that was the basic idea. Problem is, we started with it. We, we had like image segmentation, different algorithms. Then we had some outcome. We understood, is this something we cannot apply to any object? First, we need to kind of constrain and find one type of object, which was selfies and portraits in this case. And then we were lost. We were like, OK, now we have. We have a masked person, we have a person and a mask, a selfie and a mask, and now what? You know, how does this add value to any user? So I decided to, to change the process, and this is actually something that we started embracing for everything that we do right now. We start with the output, we start thinking in terms of what, is the, what are the worlds, the images that can inspire us to, do, to create a tool that actually produces this type of work. And then enter the designers that come into the team and that start working with us on different topics. And now I'm a huge advocate always of having all stakeholders at the table. So this is nothing new, but it's really difficult to, to really like emphasize that we were tied so much together in this process because we had this layer, this novel layer AI doing something and our designers had to understand exactly what it does. And at the same time, or like computer engineers or machine learners, learn, learning engineers, they had to understand what we want to do like in terms of design. So we had the common understanding and also like when we work together, things circle back and forth because for example, as you can see here, these creatives were not only because we think that's kind of beautiful, these were made with our algorithm, but especially because we know that our AI layer, as in the beginning especially, will not be super precise. There will be errors. There will, there will be just inaccuracies, and we have to deal with it. And as a designer, we thought maybe we use elements like here in the bottom of the portraits and on the sides that kind of you know make it look not that dramatic if there is an error to it. So. These things have to go back and forth between all the stakeholders in the team to, to make, to shape it, and to, to kind of create, in the end, a showcase or a product. So what we also did is that we printed out images that our designers had as an ultimate vision for our tools, and then we started like putting them on walls again, and these were like the creatives that we built. And that was the goal we want to achieve this. So it, was, it, it always helps to have something like that visually on your wall. Like an idea is always, especially if you work on vision, it's kind of simple because that's the most expressive way. Um, in the end, this is, uh, this is me and this is the tool that it's working on. So another thing was real time capability. Uh, that's one of these other things that need to be discussed between the stakeholders because at some point, the uh, product manager like me says, you know, you need to see yourself in the design in real time in order to make the right pose. And then the machine learning engineer has, engineer has to say, okay, uh, how do I do it? Because right now, like the capabilities are not where I really need to. And so I, I need to improve, they need to optimize and need to do like a shitload of work to make it actually work. Um, but it worked, so you can like download the app in the App Store. It's more right now a showcase than it's like a real product for us because this is just part of the vision where we like to have. And you can also read a little bit more about our uh, whole story with Portray and with the different tools that we built uh, at our blog and Medium. Thank you. Um, yes and no. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. 
problem with the user research is always what's the outcome. So we try to validate what we do with the users, but when we try to come up with an idea, we just try to do it with you know, rough data in the beginning. So our uh, SDK is used by kind of everything that is in, in the business, in the e-business. Let's say we, we're starting with Flickr, HP is using it for their mobile printer. We have a Shutterstock using it for stock photography. We have marketing tools using it for like Instagram scheduling. So when you schedule an Instagram post that maybe you want to change the filter, maybe you want to add some text or stickers on, on it. So you could even use it in Shopify. You could use it in kind of every context where you need to change the image, mm -hmm. even if it's just a crop, if, even if it's just a social network where you just need to kind of have your portrait and then need to crop it. Because even crop means work for a developer, at least. There is many, many challenges. Uh, it's really difficult to say which is like the main one. Um, I think still the whole setup where we have so many different clients and need to kind of harmonize our tools is always kind of something that, that takes a lot of time. And uh, also the work on AI was also pretty, was super interesting, but as I said, we started a year ago. so. Obviously, there was a lot in between where we also made like a lot of mistakes or we, we, uh, where we had to learn, okay, this is, doesn't work. So right now, the challenge is how can we go from here to a broader vision and to something even bigger um, that, for example, the AI layer really gets into the product and more than just the showcase that we have right now. I, I can't say. I mean, this is really depends on what type of image I'm, okay. I'm working. And how big can you scale the pictures? Like, how's the resolution? Like? Um, depends on your client. So <coughs> our engine is super fast, mm -hmm. and it all works on the client. But actually, we also have like a backend component right now because, for example, another big use case is print. We have a lot of clients from the printing business that use our editor, and they, for example, have 20, 30 megapixel yeah. images. And in order to make that work, we also created a server component that takes all the input and then creates a big giant file off of it. So you can print it. Okay, cool. I have a question. Yes. So uh, who's your target audience right now? Or I mean the one you would, you would like? So we have two target audiences. One is developers, product managers, people that decide on if they need a photo editor in their tool. And the second target audience is more like the not direct target audience, that's the average user that uses their tools. Like if you have big customers with millions of users, that's also our target audience because in the end we build our tools for them, but they don't pay for us. They, that's not them, but our <coughs> customer, the, the one that licenses our SDK, they pay for our product. And do you think that this could be implemented with things like Instagram or Snapchat, for example? Is that do you mean if they would implement it or if we implement it? They would implement it. They would, for example, buy it. Not Instagram because they have a very similar tech. So that's their core value. And they wouldn't like, you know, just say, okay, guys, you build it for us and we just do nothing. But we have, for example, Flickr using us. So um, in the end, yes. But from a business perspective, Snapchat and Instagram, that's their job, so why should they you know, ask us to do their job? That's kind of the problem here. 